Welcome to this edition of the ICB Distinguished Speakers Series. I'm just here to say hi for the moment. I'm going to let Michael here uh, introduce our speaker. So. Thanks, and I, uh, like I will thanks everyone for coming to welcome Nick Trefathen back to Stanford, even though we used to know him as Lloyd Trefathen. Um, it's nearly 40 years since Nick came to computer science as a PhD student. Um, Nick says he remembers sitting at Tresida, drinking coffee, and working for hours offline, <laughs> day after day he did this. This is pretty hard for most of you to imagine, probably. <laughs> um, there was no line there. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, although next here is a distinguished speaker, this is also the, the, the day for our linear algebra and optimization seminars that Jean Gollum used to run for many years. Mm -hmm. Of course, Nick remembers Gene being here for most of his academic life. Um, and I associate Nick with Sarah House. That's where a lot of us were as, as students of numerical analysis. Um, and Nick actually did have an office there for at the beginning of his PhD, right? Um, Sarah, Sarah House was at the end of Sarah's tree, and that was right next door to a co-generation plant that used to be there <laughs> until, until a few weeks ago, well, a few months ago. Um, Sarah House still does exist in there, it's over by the eye center. It's been moved twice. <coughs> anyway, um, very quickly, Nick is a very distinguished numerical analyst in law. Um, after Lee graduating from Stanford, he, he was a professor at several universities on the East Coast. Um, MIT and, well, Courant Institute in New York, MIT and Cornell, right? Before he moved to Oxford. And he's now head of the numerical analysis group there in, in something called the Mathematics Institute, right? And they've got a wonderful new building just like some of us do over in the engineering choir. Um, anyway, Nick is distinguished for having invented something called pseudospectra for non-normal matrices. I presume it's more than not unsymmetric, isn't it? Um, he's, he's also invented something called CHEDFAN, an amazing set of MATLAB routines for dealing with not just with matrices and vectors like MATLAB, but he manages to approximate continuous functions and operators. And he just told me it's all, all MATLAB, right? No VEX files. <laughs> um, anyway, very, very quickly, um, Nick won the first. Leslie Fox Prize for Numerical Analysis. This is in the UK. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering right, in the US. He's a fellow of the Royal Society in Britain. So this is why he's here as a distinguished speaker. Well, it's a pretty high standard. The next distinguished speaker. Welcome back to Stanford. Tough 
absolutely wonderful to be here. Uh, I was here from 77 to 82. This room has not changed. <laughs> and in fact, this is where we had seminars um, for the last couple of years, every week. And uh, it was amazing that people, Gene Gallup collected around him. Uh, there's old friends of mine, Joe Gercher and Rob Schreiber. And um, it's amazing, amazing to be here. Uh, everything in the engineering quad area is completely new, as you know. It's kind of astonishing to see how Stanford, it feels as if this amazing university got magically doubled, and it's just amazing. The reason I'm here besides um, visiting Stanford is that my children, who are pretty much English, have decided that the world is based in the Bay Area. <laughs> they live the square root of two blocks apart from each other in the Mission District. Um, and also, apparently, the cube root, square root of three or five or so blocks from Zuckerberg. So, um, we will never get them back to England. This is the center of the world, which is partly horrible, actually. <laughs> I must say, as an old man who lives in England, I find the energy here is kind of frightening. <laughs> the sense of responsibility to go off and change the world is its always vibrating here, and that's hard to deal with. So, I'm sure you will all go and change the world. Um, right. So this is an unusual talk in that it really does have ten pieces. They're all in the area of quadrature. Of course, not everybody will follow all the pieces. But you can start again when we reach a new one. Quadrature means algorithms for integrating functions. And this is not officially my corner of numerical analysis. But I found that in the last 10 or 15 years, I've been doing a number of things in this area. And sort of by accident, I've discovered that it is one of my interests. So I wanted to put together a bunch of things. Most of them have connections with my research over the years, so only the last two on the list explicitly involve things I'm doing now. There is a handout here, which, for example, you need. Um, you might pass them back, because I'm sure there are a few pieces of rivals. So I'll just spend a few minutes on each of these topics. And to begin with, these are the standard setting for a quadrature formula. So in one dimension, you imagine an integral over, by default, the unit integral. We approximate that by a linear combination of function values with appropriate weights. And if Gauss quadrature, Newton Coates quadrature, all these familiar things, Simpson's rule, those all fit that pattern. Now, I want to tell you some things um, that have real mathematical substance. And of course, I'm doing it so quickly that a lot of it will go by quickly. And that's why there's a handout, to remind you that each of these 10 points really does have some substantial mathematics. But also, I pick them because I think they're interesting things. And they're not the obvious subjects that quadrature experts focus on. They're things that are a little unobvious to connect in interesting directions, I believe. OK, so let's begin. The first of the 10 points is that Gauss quadrature, which is the formula everybody's heard of, Gauss quadrature, converges geometrically if you have an integrand f that's analytic. I assume you all know what an analytic function is. It's got convergent Taylor series. Geometrically, mean, it's, a synonym for that is linearly. It just means, well, here's what it means, uh, like that. So as you increase the degree of the formula on a large scale, the errors go down like a straight line or faster. So that's a theorem, and it applies to every analytic function. There's an example of an analytic function on the unit interval. This theorem has a remarkable status. I believe it should be in every numerical analysis book, because every numerical analysis book does mention Gauss quadrature. In fact, it seems to be in no numerical analysis books whatsoever. At least I haven't found one. Why? Well, Partly because maybe some people don't know this result, but probably mostly because people assume that students are scared of the concept of an analytic function. That's regarded as an advanced concept. Well, that's not as it should be. This is the most basic idea in mathematics, practically, a convergent Taylor series. What could be more basic? <coughs> students should be expected to relate to this theorem. And from now on, I hope every book will have this in it. Uh, let me spend one minute running through a proof. So one way you can explain the result is to note that if you have an analytic function on the interval, 
then it has to be analytic in a neighborhood of an integral, of the integral, and in particular, it has to be analytic in some ellipse with focus at minus one and one. And those ellipses turn out to determine everything in this business. The theorem is that the error in Gauss quadrature decreases geometrically, and the factor involved, the geometric factor, is a parameter that tells you how big the ellipse is in row. So the bigger the ellipse of analyticity, the faster the convergence. And you can prove this by looking at Chebyshev series, which I know will have meaning for some of you, but not others. You can show that Chebyshev coefficients decrease geometrically if your function is bounded and analytic in this ellipse. And then by simple estimates, you get the result you want. So it's a pretty simple theorem. And of course, it's an important one because it's the starting point of accuracy. Analytic function, geometric convergence. So, we're already 10% of the way through. <laughs> uh, the next observation is actually, strangely, maybe more familiar because people tend to rediscover it for themselves. And that is the trapezoidal rule, where you just add up equally spaced samples of a function, is spectacularly efficient, accurate, if your function happens to be periodic and analytic. So, so does means you also get geometric convergence of the equally spaced trapezoidal rule for periodic analytic functions. So that's a beautiful, useful fact. People use this all the time. Whenever you have a periodic function, the chances are adding up equally spaced samples is the best way to integrate it. Um, the history here goes back a long way. This is Poisson, good-looking romantic figure, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I like the hair especially. <laughs> So here's a classic example of a periodic integral which is non-trivial mathematically. The perimeter of an ellipse um, is, of course, you can write that as an integral that's periodic. Thanks to the symmetry, you only need to sample it at a quarter of the points, but that's basically a periodic integral. And Poisson figured out that if you sample the integral at equal to space points, you get spectacular convergence. That's the picture with nine points. So you see, with nine points, we get about nine digits of accuracy. Uh, but even with two points, just there and there, you already get two digits of accuracy. It's just amazing, <coughs> that rate of convergence. So it's a beautiful, fast, uh, analytic function, geometric convergence. You notice, you're all familiar with French, I'm sure, and he does the calculation to all those digits. And you notice this is the world's first Easter egg. He, he puts a misprint in there, <laughs> knowing that around 200 years later, somebody would do the calculation. <laughs> um, a word about where this comes from. It's for Gauss quadrature on an interval, the thing is this Bernstein ellipse. But for analytic functions that are periodic, the thing to do is look at a strip in the complex plane around the interval. So those points are the sample points on the real line, and that shaded thing is a strip of analyticity in the complex plane. If you assume that the spacing between the points is H, and the half width of the strip of analyticity is alpha, then what you find is that the error is again exponential, depending on the ratio of the width of analyticity to the grid size. And thanks to that 2 pi especially, that really is a spectacular rate of convergence. Um, this theorem was not written down by Poisson, because actually I think, I like to think that Cauchy was in the office next door inventing complex analysis while Poisson was doing this stuff. So Poisson really didn't know about complex analysis. But um, nowadays, it's an easy thing to prove. And the first person who wrote it down was Phil Davis, who's still around in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, he looked more or less like that in 59. And was like that. Um, there's an analogous result on the infinite real line as opposed to periodic. Same thing, essentially. The error is now e to the minus 2 pi times the half width of the script analyticity divided by the grid size. We're now formally speaking of an infinite sum, a, a trapezoidal rule with an infinite number of sample points. It's very unclear who first noticed this. Turing certainly used it, but Aitken more or less used it also. There's all this wonderful statistics in here. And so Henry Fetis, for example. Raise your hand if you ever met Henry Fetis. Rob, I'm sure you did. Yes, you did. Um, he, was, he was in this room at seminars now and again. Um, he was one of those old men that Gene used to introduce us to, right? <laughs> um, so, if the Riemann hypothesis 
were false, there's a pretty good chance that Turing would have figured that out because he used this trapezoidal rule in order to locate zeros on the critical line. Regrettably, he was unable to find any that weren't on the critical line. Uh, by example, uh, here's the Runge function. We imagine an infinite trapezoidal rule, very good convergence. Here's a Gaussian, even more spectacular, thanks to the very rapid decay. So with a grid size of pi over 5, which is like 0.6, you know, I, I'm not sure what this is, but it's something like that. You get 10 digits of that. Just amazing. That's why Aitken and others were using this, because in statistics, they're constantly measuring moments of distributions that have a Gaussian flavor. OK, now this one is just for fun. So everybody's heard of Simpson's rule, and you know that, well, Simpson's rule is like, it's a little higher order than the trapezoidal rule on a finite interval. But if you put them together, you get this 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4 type of effect. Now, that, I hope, when you learned about that puzzle, you think, is that really necessary? What's going on? Um, so let me remind you, you've all heard of the euler mclaurin formula, and you don't remember what it is. Never knew. Um, the euler mclaurin formula is about what to do with the trapezoidal rule if your function is not periodic. And it says, add up function samples, trapezoidal style, but then do some endpoint corrections involving derivatives. So the euler mclaurin formula tells you how to do endpoint corrections to improve the convergence of the trapezoidal rule for non-periodic functions. Now, the Gregory formula is the same, except instead of derivatives at the end, it uses finite differences. And the reason for that is just the way Poisson did the middle complex analysis. Gregory didn't know calculus because it hadn't quite been invented yet. Um, this was 1670, more or less when Newton was busy inventing calculus. Uh, and here are the formulas. So imagine a, a long string of equal samples. Um, if you're doing Simpson's rule, the weights should be a third, and then four-thirds, two-thirds, four-thirds, two-thirds, four-thirds, two-thirds, until you get to the other end when there will be another one-third. Well, the Gregory formula has the much more natural behavior that all the weights are one, except for a few that are adjusted near the end. So this has no importance in practice, but it's reassuring, I think, to realize that you don't have to be so fancy as that Simpson stuff. It's perfectly OK to do things in a more obvious fashion. So why isn't the Gregory formula famous? Why is it that we've all heard of Simpson's rule? I don't fully know the answer, but it seems to be a ratio of 4.75. So here we have the Simpson's rule and the analogous order Gregory formula, both <coughs> converging on a log-log scale with an h to the fourth error. But there's a gap between the two curves, 19 over 4. That factor is maybe why Gregory isn't more famous. It's Strange how these fashions go. So Simpson's rule is in every numerical analysis book. There's always a chapter on quadrature. It always mentions Simpson's rule. Gregory is has it used to be in a few books two generations ago, but it's sort of faded out. Whatever book you've got on your shelf, it probably doesn't mention Gregory. I'm not saying it should. You can get through life without it. But I'm always interested in intellectual foundations. It's how odd to tell this story and neglect to tell that story. Okay, so um, the next one is a very Stanford story about algorithms for computing Gauss quadrature nodes and weights. So let me remind you that Gauss quadrature is the optimal quadrature formula. If you have n nodes and n weights, and what's special here is that the points are distributed optimally so that it integrates as high as possible degree polynomials. So it's the gold standard of quadrature. And it was invented by Gauss. It really was invented by Gauss when he was 37 years old uh, in a paper in 1814. And those of us who do numerical computation um, learned about it from a guy called Golub, <laughs> who published a paper when he was 37. Um, Golub and Welsh, everybody called that paper. An amazing and beautiful result. They showed that you could compute these nodes and weights by setting up a tridiagonal matrix and doing an eigenvalue problem. And this is 1969. The eigenvalue algorithms that we know and love were just being invented, pretty much. So it was a beautiful early application of uh, tridiagonal uh, eigenvalue algorithms. Right. So 
so the amount of work for their algorithm is O of n squared. It would be n cubed for a dense matrix that's n squared because of the tridiagonal structure. Um, the eigenvalues are the uh, nodes of the Gauss quadrature formula, and the first component of the eigenvectors squared and doubled or something gives you the uh, uh, weights of the formula. It's n squared in principle. It's actually n cubed in practice because everybody writes it in MATLAB in five lines of MATLAB. And MATLAB <laughs> doesn't notice the tridiagonal structure. So um, for the last 40 years in practice, this beautiful algorithm has been an end to the third algorithm for most of us. Now, Golub died in 2007. That's the year that the O of n algorithm started appearing. Um, and Glazer, Liu, and Rocklin was the first. Many of us didn't quite hear of it. They didn't make a fuss about it. They published it in a much more general context. But then, in more recent years, a bunch of people have been getting faster and faster out of them. All the papers are published in the very journal the team founded when I was a graduate student. So Gene died believing that Gauss quadrature would never be doable for n bigger than 1,000 or so. Now, of course, there aren't very many applications where you need that. But he would have thought that, in principle, it wasn't even something you could effectively compute. But in fact, uh, much bigger numbers are easy. So I'm only going to do one chip fund demo. It's not easy for me to give a talk and only do one chip fund demo. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. Um, so let's see. We go into MATLAB. If you don't know chip fund, just Google chip fund and you'll find out. Um, <laughs> So in Chebfun, we have a command leg points. Leg stands for Legendre. And what it does is compute roots of a Legendre polynomial. So those are the three zeros of the third order Legendre polynomial. And those are also the nodes of the three point Gauss quadrature form. If you also want the weights, you could say something like uh, S comma W equals leg points of three. So there you have the nodes and weights of the Gauss quadrature form. So um, if I wanted to integrate, you know, e to the x, say, right, I'll make a function of e to the x. I could now say w times f of s. That is the Gauss quadrature approximation to the integral of e to the x on the unit interval based on three points. Uh, I'm sure most of you immediately know whether that's accurate or not. So let's see, the exact result should be e to the 1 minus e to the minus 1. So, pretty accurate. Uh, and that's only three points, of course. What if you took more points? Well, let me show you the speed of the um, current algorithm. So what I'll do is I'll say tick, and then I'll say uh, sw equals leg points of 3 talk. Now, you can never measure fast things effectively, so let's change 3 to 300. Or let's change it to 3,000. So this already is something that Golub never saw anything like that, and he would have thought it was not feasible to do that. But um, it, on this solar path, you know, it's pretty fast. Um, so, what's that? 300,000, 3 million. So that takes some time. Um, <laughs> so 3 million points in one second. So the old. These books all talk about Gauss quadrature, and then what they say is, well, it is the perfect formula. Unfortunately, computing these nodes and weights is a challenge. Well, it's no challenge. Tadashi Tokieda. Why did he take a new signal as the 300 points? Probably because that was one of my early experiments, and that lab is very strange when you do these times. I've never fully understood that. Um, What's that? It's, it's just a memory thing. If you repeat the 300, it'll yes. be much faster. Yes. Oh, um, let's see if that's true. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Why don't you just read them from the table so they haven't changed since Gauss. <laughs> Good idea. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so anyway, it's easy to do this. And by the way, just to say a serious word, it's rare that you have an application that needs the Gauss quadrature formula of size and million. But of course, in our business, we build tools that are as powerful and reliable as possible. 
just the way you don't normally need 60 digits of accuracy when you're solving an engineering problem, but IEEE arithmetic is a wonderful tool that one can count on. So now there are wonderful tools for cost forfeiture too. Uh, okay, the fifth one is getting more serious about the mathematics. This is very important and beautiful, leads in many directions, and has been an inspiration for my research. This goes back to Gauss. So, to remind you, we have an integral, and then we have a quadrature formula approximation to the integral. Now, it turns out both of those things can be represented by a contour integral. And some of you are comfortable with this in other geometry books. But here's the idea. Um, let's look first at the quadrature approximation, which is this finite sum. Now, whenever you have a linear combination of function values, assuming the function is analytic, well, a function value is the residue of an analytic function if it has a simple pole. So a linear combination of function values is a sum of weighted residues. How do you get a sum of weighted residues to do a contour integral over a contour? I should draw this contour going around your nose. If you multiply your function by a rational function r whose residues are w sub k, and whose poles are x sub k, and then compute the contour integral around all those nodes, you get the quadrature approximation to the integral of f. It's an amazing fact. So f has to be analytic for this to work, but if it is, this is a contour integral representation for that quadrature approximation. Well, the true integral also can be represented by a contour integral. Same contour. Again, we imagine we've got the unit interval and our function's analytic, so we draw a contour around the interval. The exact integral is equal to the contour integral of f times this function. And this is just <coughs> basically calculus works that out. Uh, the function is now the log of z plus 1 over z minus. So, this is what we want to calculate, the true integral. That's what we do calculate. And the amazing thing is, mathematically, they're both contour integrals, which means that to find out how accurate our approximation is, all we need to know is how close is phi to r. And if phi is very close to r, in a region of the z-plane where f is analytic, then your approximate integral is close to the two. So this is fancy mathematics that most of you probably haven't seen, and yet, it actually is the basis of surprisingly much analysis of surprisingly many things, and it really does go back to Gauss. He didn't express it in terms of a contour integral, but he did derive his formulas by finding rational functions through continued fractions that were optimal approximations to this function. So it's really Gauss's idea. Um, and then a couple of remarkable Japanese mathematicians uh, used this in the modern era for all sorts. So I want to show you, first of all, the simplest example. The simplest quadrature formula, or one of them, would be the trapezoidal rule on the unit circle, where you add up equally spaced function samples and multiply by the obvious way. That's the rational function associated with that quadrature rule. R of z is 1 over 1 minus z to the n. And just by looking at that function, we can get a sense of how these rules work. So, if z is inside the unit disk, then z to the n is about 0, so r is about 1. If z is outside the unit disk, then z to the n is about infinity, so r is about 0. So that function has this plot of its absolute value. You see it essentially 1 inside the disk, inside the circle, and 0 outside. That kind of filtering effect is related to the geometric convergence of quadrature. So, that's a case where I, you can see it immediately in the picture, of course, more generally, you don't see it in the picture. If you're interested in things involving roots of unity, we have a paper with their product. So, I mentioned more in Takahashi. Um, they use this connection between quadrature formulas and integrals to analyze the accuracy of quadrature formulas, which is sort of the way Gauss would have solved the problem. You can also go the other direction. Suppose you have a quadrature formula, you can use it to back out an approximation, a rational approximation. So in fact, 
This is a good way to find rational approximations to function. Do quadrature, figure out what rational functions is there. These are the two most famous problems of rational approximation. One is absolute x or square root of x on a finite interval. The other is e to the x on the negative real axis. In both cases, using the quadrature formula, you can get the asymptotically uh, right result. And I think I have some pictures here. So here is a picture of the best approximation to e to the x on the minus real axis. These are error curves of the difference between e to the x and its approximation. It's of degree, I think, 14, 14, or 16, 16. Blue means 10 to the minus 15th. Red means 10 to the 0. So you see this remarkable accuracy of best approximations. These are the poles of the best approximations with 16 poles. On the other hand, rather than compute a best approximation, you can do a quadrature problem on uh, using essentially the trapezoidal rule on a suitable curve. If you do all that, I'm leaving out the details, of course. Notice the difference in the pictures is there I just had dots because it's a best approximation that happens to have some poles. Here I'm doing quadrature on a curve. And these are the nodes of the quadrature formula. But the, that corresponds to poles also. So by doing quadrature, you can get nearly optimal rational approximations. Okay. Now let's go back to uh, something more elementary. I mentioned Gauss quadrature, which is the perfect formula, highest possible order of accuracy, using roots of Legendre polynomial <coughs> as the node. Fledshaw-Curtis is the more elementary idea, where instead of interpolating your function at Legendre points, you interpolate at Chebyshev points. In fact, the extrema of a Chebyshev polynomial. So it's a more elementary formula. Now, none of the books mention Clenshaw-Curtis quadrature. They all mention Gauss, and virtually none mention Clenshaw-Curtis. The reason is twofold. One reason is that Gauss would appear to have twice the order of accuracy of Clenshaw-Curtis, because when you do endpoint Gauss quadrature, you exactly integrate polynomials of degree 2n, not just n, whereas Clenshaw-Curtis is only n. The other is that Gauss quadrature was invented in 1814 and Glenn Curtis was invented in 1960. So it's hard to beat 150 years of head start. So the books all say that Gauss quadrature has a big advantage over other formulas because it's twice the rate of convergence. Here's what actually happens. The blue dots are Gauss quadrature, and the red dots are Clenshaw curves. So blue dots based on interpolating your data in Legendre points, red dots, Chebyshev points. There's no difference. If your function is very analytic, there's a difference. But if it's not analytic, there's no difference. So here we have a C infinity but not analytic function. Same rate of convergence. The standard wisdom would lead us to expect that Clenshaw curves would converge like this upper curve, but in fact it converges like Gauss. And this observation was actually made in the 60s and got lost. And then I wrote a paper about it uh, many years later. And then the beautiful paper about it is um, by Mar Bornemann in Simon in 2008. Um, I figured this out by looking at beautiful pictures of rational approximations. This is errors in Gauss quadrature rational approximations compared with errors in clenshaw curtis rational approximations. I drew these pictures and you immediately see that near the unit interval, they're the same. It's only far out that they're different. And if your mind is in the right place, you immediately conclude that unless your function is analytic in a big region, Gauss and clenshaw curtis will have the same values. But you don't need to think of it that way. There are um, theorems, beautiful theorems. Um, Basically, the state of the art is nobody knows a theorem for non-analytic functions that suggests that Gauss quadrature is any faster than Clenshaw Curtis. And moreover, in practice, there's not much difference. So this is the best thing <coughs> I know about functions that have k derivatives. It's the same for Clenshaw Curtis and Gauss. So it remains the fact that there's a beauty about Gauss quadrature, but um, the two main things that the books will tell you about it are both wrong. So the two things the books tell you are, first of all, that it's more accurate than other formulas. Well, that's wrong. And secondly, that unfortunately it's hard to compute. And well, that's wrong too. 
Okay, well, this is quite a different point. Um, but uh, of all the things I want to mention, maybe this is the conceptually most fundamental. The whole field of quadrature is based on polynomials. So virtually any formula is derived by imagining that we interpolate the data one way or another by a polynomial and then integrate that interpolate. So I want to point out that that whole way of thinking is skewed and it loses you a factor of pi over 2. Not an important factor in practice, but an important one conception. So, um, well, I just said this, I guess. Uh, all the standard formulas are based on interpolate the data by a polynomial, then integrate the interpolant. Um, the thing about polynomials is, it sounds odd, but they're really highly non-uniform. So if you have the unit interval, say, and you want to approximate a function on the unit interval, by a polynomial. The polynomials are much more powerful near the end than in the middle. Now, how would I explain that? Do I have a little bit? Ah, there's an ellipse. Okay. <laughs> so, there's one of these ellipses that comes up when you analyze polynomials. Now, let's, this is a region in which we're assuming a function is analytic. And if you want to know how accurate polynomial approximations are, you have to use these regions. They really are inevitable for polynomial approximations. Let's think what it means to require a function to be analytic in that ellipse. At zero, the function has to have a Taylor series that converges in this disk, big radius of convergence. At minus one, it has to have a Taylor series that converges in this disk, microscopic radius of convergence. So analyticity in an ellipse is a completely non-uniform requirement that demands much more smoothness of the function in the middle than near the ends. Anything you do with polynomials is implicitly making this kind of assumption of your function. So when people say that Gauss is optimal, that means it integrates exactly polynomials of the highest possible degree. Well, that may have little to do with what an engineer would care about. From the natural engineering point of view would be, I have a function. It's sort of equally smooth everywhere. What's the optimal formula for a function that's equally smooth everywhere? Um, polynomials will not give you that. So uh, uh, there are many ways of uh, getting around this. The one I happen to like is use a conformal map, turn your ellipse into an infinite strip. Uh, that turns Gauss or Clenshaw Curtis points into much more evenly spaced points. And by doing these tricks, you can get convergence at a rate up to pi over 2 times faster. You largely eliminate the clustering of Gauss or Clenshaw Curtis points the boundary. In one dimension, it doesn't matter in practice, but in higher dimensions, maybe it does. So suppose for H is an in-between. In you know, H is kind of between one and infinity, right? Um, <laughs> H is the kind of a dimension where people might really use these things in each direction in order to compute an integral. Well, if you use these more uniform points rather than Gauss points, you're beginning to get an improvement that's pretty significant. You might need 37 times fewer samples to get the same. I still don't claim this is greatly important in practice. Maybe it's a little important in practice, but it's fundamental in Oh, well, so there are some pictures from my book. We, um, one of the things Chef Fund does, you can uh, draw uh, words in it and then play with them. Oh, and so here's a theorem. For example, here's a good engineer's assumption about a reasonably smooth function. Suppose f is analytic and bounded on the unit interval and in an epsilon neighborhood of the unit. Very uniform assumption. And at, for this theorem to hold, you want epsilon to be reasonably small. Well, this is the rate of convergence you get for Gauss quadrature. And this is the rate you get for transplanted Gauss quadrature, actually slightly better than that. So there really is a provable 50% improvement um, when you dispense with polynomials and transplant them to other functions. The reason for 3 over 2 is the, the theoretical optimum is pi over 2, which is a little bigger than 3 over 2. OK. Um, so now this one is for the linear algebra people in the audience. Uh, if you've read my essay about the subject of complex analysis, when, when I was president of SIAM, I wrote these essays in SIAM News, and one of them was about the sad decline of complex analysis. Uh, and the question is, what replaced it? 
And I think what replaced it is linear algebra, because that used to be a, you know, a small subject, and now it's a huge subject. Justifiably, of course, there's no doubt that linear algebra is important. But sadly, nobody really studies complex variables enough anymore. Um, ironically, complex variables do give you some of the best methods in linear algebra. So I wanted to mention that here. Um, if you have a function of a matrix or an operator, f of a, then the basic definition of it to a mathematician, what does it mean, a function of a matrix? Well, basically it means a contour integral around the spectrum. So C is a contour in the complex plane that encloses the eigenvalues of the matrix. This is the cleanest mathematical definition of the F of F. So numerically, it's an outstanding way sometimes to compute F of F. Because contours in the complex plane are, of course, periodic almost by definition, and they can be taken to be smooth. So the trapezoidal rule and variations on that theme are very effective. And in a typical application, 10 or 20 points is enough to get you 6 or 10 digits of accuracy. So what does that mean from a linear algebra point of view? Well, if you want to sample that function, that means solving a system of equations involving z minus a. So you're solving a system of equations. But if a is sparse or has other structure, you maybe have fast ways to do that. So the idea here is to reduce the well-understood problem of linear solves Oh, sorry, to reduce the difficult problem of f of a to the well-understood problem of linear solve. And, well, you can see. Um, that's for f of a. Very analogous methods have come into play for finding eigenvalues, which are simply poles of this function, simple resolvent. Um, and the memorable name in that business is Feast. Uh, that's the name that Eric Polizzi at UMass gives to his methods of this flavor. Uh, similar work by Sakurai and Stubiura in Japan. The idea is to find eigenvalues of a matrix by regarding them as poles of a function, and you find those poles by doing a contour. OK, so that's, those are the eight topics that um, are in my past, sometimes long before I was born, in fact. Um, and then the final two are things that uh, we're working on nowadays. So, this has to do with perturbed points, and I guess I'd like to tell you the story of why I got into it. So, um, it's been a funny theme of my last three years, that Andre Vedeman and I were writing this paper about the trapezoidal rule and its fast convergence. And I got interested in the analogy between the trapezoidal rule, exponentially convergent, and the Faraday cave. Because, you know, the Faraday cage phenomenon is that if you have um, a, a bunch of wires forming a cage, then there's hardly any field inside. And that seemed like the same mathematics. Because, you know, how could it not be? You've got the conditions imposed at periodic points. There's a field out there. Something exponential is going on. So that must be how Faraday cages shield electrostatic and electromagnetic fields. But the more I thought about it, the, the more directions this went. And one of them was um, the trapezoidal rule depends, the superconvergence of it depends on having equally spaced points. Does a Faraday cage depend on having perfectly spaced wires? Well, I hope not. Uh, because, of course, they're not going to be perfectly spaced in any actual cage. And of course, obviously, physically, how could it possibly depend on that? If you have reasonably well spaced things, of course, a Faraday cage will be fine. So that got me thinking about quadrature analogs. Does the trapezoidal rule depend on having the points exactly evenly spaced? Um, well, the answer is no if you view it right. And I forget what's on the slide here, so let me find out. OK. So here we have the trapezoidal rule for a periodic function. We have what? 1 to 12 points or something? And the error in the quadrature is like 10 to the minus 15. There's an underlying approximation there, which uh, the trapezoidal rule is equivalent to interpolating your periodic function by sines and cosines, a trigonometric interpolant, and then integrating the interpolant. It turns out the accuracy of that interpolant is sort of the square root. So it's about six digits, quadrature is maybe 12. Suppose we perturb the points. 
So we can think of this as our Faraday cage that hasn't been manufactured quite as well. Will we lose the geometric convergence or not? Well, not if we think of the trapezoidal rule properly. Forget trapezoids. Think of the trapezoidal rule in a deeper sense as being trigonometric interpolation followed by integration of the integral. So here the blue curve is the trigonometric interpolant to the perturbed data point. We integrate that and we find, sure enough, that the quadrature, we, it's now square rooted, we no longer have that double accuracy, but it's still exponentially convergent. It's comparable to the approximation accuracy. So sure enough, as you would expect, perturbed points are no problem. So then you start looking for the literature, and there isn't any. It's very strange. Um, let me remind you of two facts I've mentioned. If you have an analytic function, you get geometric convergence. I guess I haven't quite mentioned that if you have a continuous function, you get convergence, for now, Sir and John Curtis, or the periodic trapezoidal rule. So what happens if you perturb the points? And a natural setting is to imagine that each point can be <coughs> perturbed a certain fraction of the way to the next point, and that fraction is alpha. So we have our points, and we're going to allow each one to be perturbed up to a fraction alpha of the distance to the next one. If alpha is less than a half, then the points are staying separate. And here's what you find. We don't know a single paper in the quadrature literature that considers this question. In the approximation theory literature, you find that you get, they claim that you get convergence even if the points coalesce. And that's true in a, one of these theoretical non-robust senses. If you have coalescent points, you'll get spectacularly unstable methods. Um, but it's true mathematically that with no rounding errors, principally converge. And then you have this, the subject of sampling theory. So um, let me give you a 30 second summary of what sampling theory is and how it relates to your eye um, The fundamental question of approximation theory is if you have a function with a certain smoothness, how fast do certain approximations convert? You approximate a smooth function by polynomials, how fast do they convert? Approximate a periodic function by sines and cosines, how fast do they convert? The fundamental theorem, a uh, uh, question of sampling theory is what class of functions can be recovered exactly? So for example, if you have a function that's an entire function band limited to some amount, how many sample points do you need? The Nyquist limit. So the Nyquist limit is the prototypical theorem of sampling theory. It's virtually the same. The mathematics is almost the same. And yet the focus of people is very different, and I don't know sampling theory. I'm sure some people here do. In sampling theory, there's a thing called codex theory, which tells you that alpha equals one four is a critical number. So you're perturbing your points, and it's not enough to keep them from hitting each other. You have to keep them, they're only allowed to go a quarter of the way towards each other. So they have to stay very separated in order to have a Reese basis. Now, what does a Reese basis mean? Of course, none of us remember that. Um, uh, it sort of means energy conservation in L2. What does that have to do with quadrature? I think <coughs> nothing. We're just proving the theory now. But as far as I can tell, one quarter has no relevance whatsoever to approximation or quadrature. Um, so I think what we are in the process of showing is um, that if you perturb the points, the same old non-robust uh, result that the approximation theorists have mentioned is still true. And the quadrature convergence in practice, continuous function getting the right answer, holds so long as the points remain separate. So alpha less than a half is the crucial thing. If anyone knows any literature on this, yes? Yeah. Well, first the one of course is only critical if you have a spaces. If you have a frame, it doesn't matter. So if you have more points, then this result doesn't apply. You can have more. Yeah. So I think that's the first thing. Yeah. You will have free spaces, otherwise it's not relevant. Yeah. And I think you're in a frame setting, so. Doesn't apply. So then that would be like changing interpolation to least squared. Um, that's well, if the measurements are exactly still interpolate, you just have an overcomplete set, but you preserve measurements exactly in the but same number of You have to choose. Uh, well, but if, if it's exact, then it's a minimum mass. Minimum mass interpolation is not least squares, right? If have exact measurements, I've made regularized interpolation. Okay, so that is a whole other framework. Yes. Yeah, but then I don't have one more course, so it doesn't yeah. apply. I think that's a, that's why it doesn't matter. Uh, I 
Because he, so let, let me argue with you, because I can't resist. You know, even though I live in England, I'm still American. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I agree with you. Everything you said is true. However, uh, it's, that's going off in another direction. There's still the question of whether these formulas that I'm talking about break down in a quarter. Uh, your argument is that that's the wrong question. We should be using other forms. Well, if you have, maybe if that's you have, true. If you have <laughs> sufficiently few points, yeah. you will at some point be in a setting of a real spaces, then it probably does apply. But if you have more points, you're not, not in a setting of a real spaces, in a setting of a frame, which the real spaces as a special case, but then the one of doesn't apply to do more of us. Um, and then the last topic is multi-dimensional. So this is one on which I've been asking everybody I've seen in the last few months if they've seen this before, because the observation I want to make is so elementary, but nobody seems to have made it. So this happens to me often, and it's a little embarrassing, because it, in the end, you, you know somebody's done this 100 years ago. Um, so here's the elementary observation. Um, oh, so we have the table. Um, let me first make a few remarks about a very big subject these days that touches many people in this room and elsewhere. Um, the curse of dimensionality is everywhere, and we're all busy fighting it in all sorts of ways, and I've listed some of these familiar ways that people try to fight the curse of dimensionality. Now, in some sense, if you're trying to represent an arbitrary function and really deal with it in high dimensions, if Arbitrary functions really can have arbitrary structure. I don't think you can really beat the curse of dimensionality for arbitrary functions. However, these methods I've mentioned are very effective in many cases. And it would seem that the reason for that is many problems that arise have involved functions that are not arbitrary. In particular, very often, the different variables that, to, that define a function are somewhat decoupled. You have a function, maybe you're doing an integral in 100 dimensions. There's a pretty good chance that your x, y, z, and so on variables are naturally distinct, which one could describe as some kind of alignment of functions with the axioms. Um, and this is not the main point I want to make, but it's a bit of rhetoric here. Uh, if you look at the literature, most papers don't talk about this. The typical setting is, Somebody has a low rank compression algorithm that does great things for their application. They say, we face the curse of dimensionality. To beat it, we do this. The implication being somehow that the need to beat the curse is enough to generate the method to beat the curse. Well, that's not true. Um, the fact that there's a curse uh, does not entail a solution to the problem. You need special properties. And um, I wish the literature would focus on that more. And let me make an analogy. So we all, all numerical people at least, know a lot about iterative methods for matrix problems, conjugate gradients, I know all that stuff, gene gradients. We all know that conjugate gradients doesn't work for an arbitrary symmetric positive adjustment matrix. You need a good condition number or a good distribution of eigenvalues. That's the first thing we all say about iterations. They need preconditions. We would never think of saying that conjugate gradients is a good method for solving problems in general. That would be considered a, a, a mistake. You'd lose points on an exam for, for saying that. Um, so I think this field of matrix iteration has a more solid foundation than what people are saying about low rank methods, where about half the papers imply, even though they don't say it, that maybe everything can be compressed. That's not true. So I don't have a solution to this problem. I'm just urging all of us in this business to use matrix iterations as a model and try to get a little more responsible in the things we say about um, low rank compression. That's not the point I wanted to make. So here's the last page. This is uh, an observation about approximation in squares or cubes or paper cubes. So in Chev fun, we're constantly drawing pictures like this. We have a function and we want to approximate it to machine precision on an interval. So here the function is e to the minus 100x squared. What degree polynomial do you need to approximate that to 15 digits? So in Chebfine, it's doing that all the time. You need degree 120. So indeed, to people on our team, that function essentially is a polynomial of degree 120. You can't do it to 15 digits with degree 100. You really can't. That's optimal. 
So now let's ask, what about a multidimensional version of that? So let's take our function e to the minus 100x squared and make it radially symmetric. So that's the same function, except now it's in the square instead of the interval. x squared plus y squared did exactly the same behavior in that direction, and of course in all the other directions too. So let's ask, what degree bivariate polynomial should we need to get that to 15 degrees? Now, here's a hint. Obviously, the function is isotropic. Moreover, according to the standard definition of degree, multivariate polynomials are also isotropic. What I mean by that is the degree of a polynomial, a multivariate polynomial, <coughs> is the sum of the degrees of its different components. So, for example, um, this has degree 2, this has degree 2, and x squared times y squared would have degree 4. So, the reason for that definition of degree is that it's isotropic. f is isotropic. We conclude that we would expect to need degree 120 for the bivariate. So, here's a picture of that expectation. So, I'm going to plot the Chebyshev coefficients <coughs> in x and y for that function. And the expectation is that to resolve it to 15 digits, we should need the coefficients below the red line in this triangle. That's the triangle corresponding to bivariate polynomials of degree 120. Now, you have some symmetry because it's radial. You know longer going maybe it's one to one in some sense. So you're going to gain a factor of two somewhere. Uh, if you don't mind my guessing. I'm still going <laughs> minus one to one. Um, uh, on x and y, but not on r. Okay, maybe, yeah. So here's what you actually see. That, um, these are contour lines of the sizes of the Chebyshev expansion coefficients when Cheb fun 2 resolves this function to 15 digits. What we find is essentially the things within the purple curve are the the Chebyshev coefficients that are non-zero, speaking. Um, along the x direction, 120. Along the y direction, 120. But out there, it's 120 square root of 2 degrees. So the standard notion of isotropy for multivariate polynomials has got it wrong. Now, once you see that, it's easy to see why. Because um, approximating this function along the diagonal of a square, well, that's an interval of length 2 square roots of 2 instead of 2. Um, it's a longer interval, and on a longer interval, you need more Chebyshev coefficients. It's obvious um, once you look at it that way. And yet, we can't find any discussion of this matter. Now, a square root of 2 is hardly exciting, um, but in higher dimensions, everything accumulates exponentially. You get square roots of d, where d is the number of dimensions, but you get d raised to the square root of d. So, um, in fact, d equals 8 again is my favorite non-small non dimension. Um, as far as we can tell, to resolve a function in eight dimensions, check on eight if you like, um, will require 639 times as many coefficients as the standard wisdom would suggest, because the standard wisdom is based on a simplex rather than a spherical ball of coefficients. So we're totally puzzled about this, trying to find the literature, trying to prove some theorems. If anyone has any idea, we're about to do that. I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. function that's difficult to integrate, but I can split it into a positive function that's highly variable and one that's pretty smooth. And I use that positive function that's highly variable to calculate weights. Then the points concentrate where the action is. Oh, okay. And I wondered if that's a, a well-known result. I don't know. I simply don't know. Um, I take refuge in the fact that I'm not a quadrant. Nor am I, which is why I'm asking. So could you elaborate a little bit on the coalescing points that you, you mentioned under item number? Oh, two? yes, thank you. Um, because uh, of you're interested in that. So um, when two points coalesce and you have an interpolation problem, mathematically that's easy. It's the thing called the Hermitian integral formula, which was invented by Koch. Remember that. It wasn't invented by Hermitian. Even Hermitian says, 
Here's because we close. So when two points coalesce, you know, as they get closer and closer, the interpolation can do crazy things. As they coalesce, you interpolate the function value and the derivative, of course. So if you use that notion of coalescence, then nothing uh, singular happens when two points coalesce for unpredictable. On the other hand, if your function merely has a few derivatives, then the Lefebvre constants go to infinity and everything can go wrong. What would be the best reference for that? You had Malawak 1969. You had a reference for that. It was H L A W. Oh, Lawka. Oh, I think that's in the I forget if that's in German or Czech or Hungarian or something, but no, I don't have to look at that. Uh, I don't know. Send an email. Thank you. Can Chuck always find big computer as we can at all points? Say it again. Can, oh, can it be pre-computed? Yeah, I mean, can they be computed as quickly as Gauss one? Even faster, but the, uh, because they're just cosine, basically. Um, but it's less than ten times faster, so they're they're both lickety split. Basically. Um, so this function, the this is in the function. Is this anything? In it happens to be. Yes. Yeah, but. Does does uh, do the counter plots uh, counter plots look like that for functions that have that poles in the buffers? Yeah, oh absolutely. Yeah. This is just an initial example. Um, where when I did this example I hadn't done very many others, but now we've been exploring it. It really is a more general thing. Is it a perturbed point? Do you think that there's any wisdom to gain for adaptive methods? Well adaptive methods tend not to be based on global interpretation. The whole power of adaptivity is to do something more local. So I think that's a different context, mostly. There's an exception to that. Um, once you start doing adaptive rational improvements, you can begin to get the best of both worlds. There are things you can do with very uneven grids based on rational improvements that are spectrally convergent. But that's, that's pretty fancy stuff. It's not the same. Kind of naive question. Since multivariate polynomials are isotropic and if I have a hypercube and most of the volume in a hypercube is concentrated in the corners, yes. shouldn't that tell me that something did go wrong? I think so, yeah. yeah. Somebody must have pointed this out. So it is a, it's a funny thing that, of course, if you're doing multidimensional intervals, of course, God does not say you have to work in a rectilinear form. Well, in principle, you could work in a sphere. Nobody really does. Everybody's always in the hypercube. So uh, maybe, I don't, obviously you're aware, but maybe some people aren't aware that uh, high dimensional hypercubes have amazing geometry. The fraction of the volume that's in the inscribed sphere goes to zero, and in fact goes to zero pretty quickly as the dimension increases. So the inscribed sphere is nowhere in a big hypercube. Everything is near the corners. Any other questions? Yeah, I Let's go and thank again. I heard Mr. Taylor was very important today and today everybody's so excited.